Thanks very much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so I'm an engineering lead on two of our product teams uh, in Intercom. Um, about 14 months ago, I introduced Ember to Intercom. Um, it was uh, a bit of a bet. Um, we, uh, previous to that, we had a pretty large and growing Rails application. Um, uh, the UI was becoming quite, quite complex, uh, a lot of jQuery, um, a lot of problems with regression bugs. Uh, performance was an issue, development productivity was an issue, and I saw Ember as uh, something that could solve a lot of these problems. Um, uh, a year and a bit later, um, we've replaced the whole of Intercom's UI uh, with Ember. Um, out of our 50 engineers that we have, maybe 30 or so of them have contributed to the Ember, Embercom project. Um, um, probably around 18 uh, actively work on the, the Ember app. Might even be more, might be 22 or something like that. Um, I wrote this blog, blog post uh, about a year ago, right at the beginning, and kind of outlining what the promise of Ember was for Intercom. And uh, basically, we, we've uh, we've been rewarded handsomely for uh, making that bet on Ember. Um, Intercom, if uh, for. Uh, I'll give a quick demo so you can have, a, have an idea of what it, what it is. Um, this is Intercom here. Uh, so uh, this is uh, I've logged into a test app uh, in Intercom here. Um, our mission is to make web business personal and to allow any web business and all businesses are increasingly, all businesses will be web businesses, um, to allow them to have personal and lightweight interactions with their, with their customers. Um, uh, if you install Intercom in your own app or your own uh, mobile uh, app, um, uh, either through the JavaScript widget or through our Android or iOS SDK, um, you get uh, this little widget, uh, this in-app messenger is installed. So we use it within our own product as well. And this allows you to track things that your users are doing. It allows you to push data about your users to capture key events. Um, what we're seeing here is a list of the, the users who are active on my fictitious uh, application. Um, we can segment users, you see up the top right, there's a list of segments, we can see who's active, um, who's created a project more than five times, who's slipping away, who's thinking about upgrading but hasn't yet. Um, uh, from here, uh, and the thing I'm actually going to talk about today is uh, content creation within Intercom. Um, what we're looking here is, you know, we want to send a simple message to uh, this person, um, uh, it will pop up. It uh, could either be an in-app or an email. If it's an in-app, it'll pop up uh, in, in your own app. Um, uh, this content editor here, um, uh, it's, it's simple. It's, uh, it, it has a number of capabilities. So we can insert like you know attributes. It's got uh, popovers. And it does things like it knows about the, s the scroll position, so we can drop it anywhere in the application and it reacts like that. Um, we can you know, bold and italic, and it's got keyboard shortcuts. We can add links. Um, we can navigate around. Um, so a lot of this stuff you get for free with Content Editable. We re really want to control and have very precise, uh, very precise control over um, how this editor reacts. So uh, we. Uh, as I've explained, we kind of uh, had two goals at it. The second goal, we decided to uh, basically ditch most of what uh, Content Editable gives you and re-implement it ourselves. Um, this is one area that uh, the editor is used. Um, another is uh, creating, creating uh, auto messages. An auto message is something based on some criteria that you can queue up for mess uh, messages for your users to receive. So it might be something like, um, when someone has been a user for three days, you might uh, send them an auto message and say, hey, how's it going? So I'll just uh, write this here. So users who signed up, uh, let's say, more than three days ago. And we will make this an email. And here again is the, the content editor, here again. Uh, this is slightly different than you see on the left hand side. As I scroll up and down, that it's, it's tracking the areas where we can drop things in. So I can put in buttons, for example. Uh, it's got alignment, uh, 
uh, various things you can put in, HTML blocks, uh, images, um, data attributes, again. Um, I can also preview that in mobile. Uh, we can A-B test it, so we can have two versions of it. Um, I'll actually go back and switch to an in-app, which are actually... Uh, This one's slightly different, and it has headings, for example. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll come, back to, come back to that when I go into some of the details of how this thing works. Um, a third place that we use it in, uh, in Intercom is uh, in the inbox. So uh, the inbox is a, a shared inbox across your team, and as you have conversations with your customers, um, this thing comes to life. Um, and this is the composer down here, and uh, some interesting things about here is we have things like save replies, for example. Um, we also have uh, Moji. Uh, and, uh, oh, that was actually a, yeah. We, we have a sticker, so if you do a single emoji, it becomes a sticker. Um, uh, if we put in single emoji, or a number comes in like that. Um, also we have things like uh, mentions. <coughs> okay, and you know, you can drop, try and drop images in, and um, there's, there's many things we're doing with this uh, over time. Uh, basically every, every, every page or every section of Intercom um, very soon will allow you to enter in content. So the composer is uh, really important for us. Um, so it's it's an add-on. Uh, um, I'll show you it here. So we, we began it about six months ago. It's actually quite a big project. Um, uh, it's mainly three people working on it: Paddy, Pat, and myself. A um, couple of things to note about it. I mean, it's almost three thousand commits. It was a really big project. But, um, it's uh, building a con. Uh, content editor in the browser is surprisingly difficult. Um, we've something like, I think, two, over 2,000 tests as well to make sure it, it, it works uh, correctly. Um, so I think why is it an important question? Because uh, this, is, this is actually, it's Composer 2, it's, uh, or B2, it's our, actually our third version. Composer B0 is basically a text box. That, Accepted HTML or whatever. Uh, Composer B1 was based on content editable, and uh, we uh, released it and uh, struggled with bugs for months and months, and actually got to a point where we had like maybe 80 or 90 bugs that were almost impossible to fix, um, and it, it it resulted in sitting down and you know, redesigning this thing um, and uh, accepting that we needed to put in a uh, big effort to build something uh, really simple. And uh, that we had full control over. Uh, my colleague Pat gave a talk uh, to Dublin JS um, a couple of months ago about content editable, and I'll just uh, share a couple of these slides because it's kind of interesting and it kind of uh, outlines uh, the kind of problems we have. Um, the APIs specified here were originally introduced in IE, but subsequently have been copied by other browsers in a haphazard and imprecise fashion. Although the behavior specified here does not match any browser, it can serve as a target to converge to in, in the future. This was in 2014, so I mean, right now, content editable is uh, is still a bit of a mess. Um, it's very difficult to do anything uh, anything ambitious with. Um, so here's a kind of example of that. Um, so we have a content editable div. It's got a single character in it. Uh, I think it's what happens when we press enter. So in Chrome, it uh, appends an empty div and puts the card in that new div. Same in Safari. Uh, in IE 11, it's a paragraph. In Firefox, a break and another break with a type. <laughs> uh, it, this is one small example of maybe uh, 50 or 100 cases, or you know, probably a lot more. We didn't discover them all, but. Um, it's just it's it's really hard to work with this, and um, it makes uh, anything really uh, doing anything ambitious really difficult. 
uh, there's other examples like uh, putting in weird styles and um, there's also like some of the APIs, uh, selection API is a very difficult exec command is uh, an API that you can manipulate uh, content and selections within uh, within content editable. And again, it's it's full of full of bugs. So here's the kind of API it has, and uh, there's just uh, huge differences in how these things work and uh, what works and what doesn't across the browsers, as as we found found out. Um, uh, <coughs> Some of them work with undo, some of them don't. So I mean, like undo is something we, when you start typing into a text area in, in the browser, it's like this, you get all this stuff for free. You don't even think about it. like if you type a line of text and it flows over into another line, and you go up to the character. It doesn't just go directly up. It, you know, picks left or right. It kind of remembers where you were, and you go back down again as you navigate around. There's all this state that it's managing internally. Um, and it's only when we started building it that we realized, okay, uh, you know, uh, we can't handle the up character, for example, because we won't be able to put it in the place that people expect it. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, I'll, I'll link to this, but there's a lot of, uh, just this, these slides outline all of the complexity there, and uh, ultimately why we decided to build um, uh, our V2 composer which actually is a block editor and not a HTML editor. So um, uh, we have, we created this thing called the block object model, <coughs> which represents content as we want content to be in Intercom. Um, it's reasonably simple, um, but it's not HTML. Um, so the composer is a component. Um, it's got two main parts to it. One that manages uh, the document object model, the DOM, and the other, the block object model. Um, the DOM consists of a view that captures all of the events that happen. Uh, mouse moves, clicks, um, character, uh, keyboard uh, entries, anything like that, paste events. Um, it deals with the DOM selection, so the range, when you drag your cursor over some content, that actual selection. Um, the UR, UI coordinates of where your mouse is, and you can do insert points and things like that. And also deciding when to do uh, rendering. Uh, the block object model um, uh, has this thing called composer state, which uh, houses things like our custom undo stack. So we, we uh, as we as we we found out with content editable that to have a coherent uh, undo redo stack, we just have to uh, take control of that ourselves. We have to take control of bold rules, italic rules, return backspace, uh, control backspace, control left left character, right character, all of these things that you normally get for free. Um, and then we have uh, blocks for the actual data structure that represents the content. Um, I, uh, as I was building these slides today, I uh, posted on Slack for some of my colleagues to uh, let me know. Gustav is a designer, I think you might guess. He's uh, uh, formulated <laughs> the boxes around the land. Which, uh, <laughs> they still aren't, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Um, so the block object model, I guess, is the, uh, one of the most, or probably the most interesting part of it. Um, it's got an undo stack. Uh, it deals with block selection. Um, it has a block list which represents uh, content. I'll actually just jump into, uh, this is the demo app um, for uh, our CLI component, which is Embercom Composer. And um, you can see here, if I uh, type hello and press space, there's a couple of things to notice. Um, one, this this uh, this here is actually the block object model selection. So right now it's saying that the carrot is in position six. And you see as I move left and right, um, that represents the actual selection state. If I change it to a range, you can see that it's gone from uh, I see uh, one to four. Uh, now it's, it's three dimensional, so um, the the rightmost uh, numbers are the lowest level. So if I put in a couple of returns and say another paragraph, you can see that I'm in uh, block index one. So if I, if I press up, that'll jump to zero and then back to one again. So this, uh, as you can see, as I move around, um, it represents where I am on the block object model. You can see when I can select across uh, blocks. So this becomes very important when we uh, want to mutate the block object model, if I want to apply a bold to this. As I said, the browser isn't going to do the bold for us. We need to do the bold ourselves. Um, 
On the right-hand side here, we have some representations of what the composer, the block object model is. So here's the HTML that's actually been rendered. Um, uh, this is a JSON representation of the blocks. And this is actually the block object, object model here itself. Um, if I do something like do a bold, for example, um, you'll see that uh, the block object model has uh, it has text of the first block, and it has a bold entity which goes from uh, two to six within it. And there's, there's a second bold entity in the second block, uh, which goes from two to two, which is exactly what we're we're seeing up there. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, in a little a little while because there's some interesting things uh, there. Um, so to mutate the composer, we run commands on it. So backspace, delete, return, uh, insert attribute, paste, things like that. Um, so uh, here's a simple example. So let's say we have the text below there. And uh, I'll actually mirror this here. So I think this is italic and this is bold. Okay, so uh, the blocks that we have, we have a single block, a single paragraph. Um, the carrot is in uh, the after the first character. Um, the paragraph has two entities, italic and bold, which uh, go from various ranges. Um, if I choose a selection, you can see the selection on the right-hand side changes. Um, if I was to bold that, um, you'll see that I'm actually just we're running this command on the, on the, the bold entity. Um, if we run bold again, you'll see that it actually applies bold to. Um, you notice that if I press bold twice, the, the result is different. So we have to uh, re reverse engineer all of these little things that the browser does that you might notice, but if you were to use our composer and they did something different, you would definitely notice there's something, uh, something not right with our composer. Um, so some of the kind of interesting things that we do, um, if I type, uh, let's say, this is a list, for example. But we want it so that if someone types one, if they want to do, uh, you know, they don't want a list, they just want to type the character one zero, um, that they can actually backspace into it and it actually becomes just the text one uh, point and it's not a list anymore, as opposed to it actually being a list. Um, that's the same for things like that. Um, what else is interesting? Uh, let's see. So I think like, rules like joining text. So what should happen when you go from uh, press backspace here? Well, I mean, that makes sense. But again, we have to build all of these rules uh, ourselves. Um, this necessitates uh, a lot of tests. So uh, we have a huge amount of tests that look like this. Um, we have a nice uh, DSL for writing these tests. So. This is saying uh, these, this DSL is about is testing the case where backspace is pressed. And before we have, let's say, an ordered list that has two items, and we have a particular selection, start and end. And then after the delete, we expect uh, this to happen and the selection to be like that. So we, we have hundreds and hundreds of tests like this, which are just ensuring that uh, same rules are, are happening within the composer. Um, syncing is interesting as well, so uh, a lot of the stuff you get for free with Ember doesn't apply here because it's, it's, Ember isn't uh, designed to work in a world within content editable. Um, when Tom Dale was over working with us uh, at the, um, uh, early last year, um, he did a spike out which, of, of this which used uh, low level Ember <coughs> stuff and it was really interesting but um, uh, we uh, found we had to we, we hit a wall with, with Ember, it's, it's um, with, sorry, I should say with the view layer in Ember, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not optimized for working with content editable itself. I mean, it's a different world. Um, so we, we take on syncing ourselves. So some UI event happens, a keystroke, a click, um, paste, something like that. Um, and it's either going to be a command that we run or uh, sync, which uh, I'll talk about in a second. Um, Either one of those can mutate the bomb, the block object model. Um, from that, then we can get a, a HTML representation of the uh, the block that's changed, and we, we do a uh, sort of a DOM diff, not as clever as uh, Glimmer does, but um, we compare them, and if there is a difference, we 
uh, invoke that change and done. We then uh, reset the cart to where it was, and that happens every time you, um, not every character, sometimes we just, we, uh, we don't do a sync um, for performance reasons. So for example, if I type hello, you'll see that um, nothing is updated yet. But if I click away, it will. Or if I press a space, it does. Um, if I do a backspace into the word, it doesn't. But if I have a bold entity in there, it doesn't. It does. It does. You can see it's 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 updating there. So we've all these rules about. Um, uh, we're very specific about when something key has happened, when we need to mutate the DOM and uh, re-render part of the composer, and we do it. But as much as possible, we we. Uh, queue it up so um, the browser is quick. So really, what we want is this thing to be, you know, uh, very fast, and that people simply won't notice it, and it actually feels like a text area when there's actually all oh, this this whole cycle going on pretty much all the time. Um, uh, performance is really important to us, so uh, we have all of these metrics that we capture. Um, for various things like uh, syncing, so you see we actually haven't, we've only done one sync there. Um, calculation stuff, key up, key down, these have to be really quick. Uh, we have things like insert character, calculating the inner HTML of a particular block, uh, blocks backspace. Uh, interesting, when I just click on the browser there, it's actually running some of these things. Um, and this is what allows us to uh, keep performance uh, quicker. We're actually making it faster and faster all the time because um, as it's rolled out to more and more parts of Intercom, um, the more important it is to be uh, really quick. Um, <coughs> one of the things I want to do is uh, open source um, as much of this as possible. Uh, go like this. Sorry, Ember on Doobstack. So um, this is the first baby steps towards doing that. All right. Uh, so this is the undo stack that we uh, we extracted out of it, and uh, you, it's a very simple uh, Ember CLI can uh, add on. I think it's like forty or fifty lines of code, but it allows you to do an undo stack very easily in your own application. Um, I think there's probably 10, 15 uh, add-ons that we can extract out of the composer. And um, we'll never make the whole composer open source because uh, it just is so much specific to Intercom within it. Uh, I was chatting to uh, Tyler Love from Bustle, who's, they're also building something like this. A slightly different model, but they're open sourcing the whole thing, so we're, we're looking at the areas that we uh, intersect and that we can uh, both uh, work on the open source components that, that make up the, the commonality. Um, so I expect to be open sourcing uh, more of the composer uh, soon. Um, how am I doing for time? <laughs> five minutes? Yeah, five minutes and then we yeah. can Q&A. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, there's some, some other things we do. Uh, uh, this is something I'd like to uh, open source as well. Um, sorry, not that. Um, custom styling. No. Nope. Uh, sorry, where is this? Uh, it's, it's not that. <laughs> sorry, it's been a little while since uh, I've actually worked on this project and working on other things, and the menu has changed slightly. Uh, or I'll show it you in the app. So. So let's say if I'm in an email, uh, one of the things that's hard is, that, well, the, a challenge is that um, we, we allow our customers to create their own email templates. And the problem with email templates is they can put any HTML in, any CSS. And usually what you do in that scenario is you just render the whole thing in an iframe so it's isolated from the page. It's, it's got its own natural CSS reset. You can't leak styles out or in. Um, uh, but because uh, we've got this composer and it's part of the Ember application, 
Uh, we can't just stick an iframe in there, so we have to solve it a different way. We came up with this, uh, um, this, uh, so, so let me find a template that actually works. Some of these are, uh, let's try this one, okay. So uh, we came up with this technique uh, that we're, we needed a better name for it. We call it CSS slurping. So we take the template, we inject in the content that we know we'll allow, so like all of the possible blocks that you can have. Um, put it off to an iframe, run through the DOM, extracting key CSS uh, uh, styles for all the things we care about, and then building our own name, and putting that in a namespace, and then injecting it into the page around the composer. So it actually allows us to uh, uh, allow our customers to inject their own styles here, and for us to have it completely isolated from the rest of the application. Uh, uh, editors, I think I'll skip over. We've all these editors when you uh, select a range of text. Actually, I'll do, I'll do it very briefly. So um, it's simply these here. We've got like 10 different types of editor. Um, well, um, what's interesting about them? Uh, I guess they, they're, uh, let's see. So on the right-hand side, we keep track of things like we have computer properties like um, Some way with the styles there. Um, okay, try it here. I have two composers on that page. So uh, we keep track of things like the current editable entity and block, and uh, that does not seem to be updating. So I'll just skip over that. I can't show that performance I talked about. Um, last thing is testing, and we have lots and lots of tests. I'll just run them in the background as I as I go out. Um, there is uh, literally thousands of them, um, so I'll leave that there. Uh, so that's it. There's loads of things I could have talked about. Um, uh, there's so many directions to go deep in the composer. There's so, so much detail in there. Um, and I'd be happy afterwards if anyone's got any, any questions to uh, chat about any of those things. Uh, so any questions? I, I, was, I was going to ask you what your strategy is in terms of versions of Ember. Which one are you on? And yeah. How often do you update? <coughs> and right, so we're on uh, one ten at the moment. I custom built one ten with some feature flags turned on. Um, we, uh, um, as much as possible, try to stay up to date. And um, our application is uh, pretty large now, and there's like uh, four different product teams out of the eight or nine teams that we have that uh, build a lot of Ember. Or build their application in Embercom. Um, so it takes a little bit of coordination to uh, upgrade. Um, in some cases, there are uh, some areas of the application where we've done something very advanced where we, we've uh, uh, crossed the boundary into using some private APIs. Um, and as we upgrade, they become uh, things that take a little bit of time. Um, uh, so we're really interested and we're really motivated. Um, I've all next week block booked to work on uh, testing with Glimmer because um, uh, for an, Ember, or an application like Intercom, which is pretty large, it's, it's uh, data heavy, data binding heavy. Um, uh, we've like, you know, the, the inbox for example, it's pretty static when we look at it there, but when you turn on real time and you have uh, hundreds of conversations coming in every hour and the whole thing's moving around, um, speed is, is critical. Uh, so the promise of uh, Glimmer is that it's going to uh, make our application just way faster than it is. Um, if we, if Glimmer, let's say, it never happened, we would have had to invest a lot of time into solving that performance ourselves, and that would have meant, you know, uh, ducking down in some components to manage things ourselves. Um, I call it the uh, ducking down to metal sometimes when it's really jQuery. It's not like assembly or whatever, but uh, the metal. Um, uh, so yeah, we're really motivated. To to uh, keep up to date, we're um, uh, I guess two point releases behind now, but um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be on we'll be on uh, I would imagine a couple of weeks after it's released. Thanks. Just looking at all the config values there, I mean, it looks like you've got lots of different situations where this has slightly different permutations of functionality. Yeah. Yeah. How are you finding? Is it literally just that you just have a flat config and you just configure it differently in different places, or uh, do you have like different? Like, like an inheritance structure, like a composition structure? Right. How are you managing that? Right, so uh, we we have lots of uh, uh, 
features you can turn on and off. Then we have these uh, scenarios. So this is uh, like uh, in app, app announcement turns these things on. Um, plain email turns these things on. Email turns these on. We have an e email canary that we can feature flag in our own app and try it out. Um, so all of the different places in app chat, um, this, this enforces what's allowed and what isn't. And we have tests to do, verify that those things are on so you basically like pass a config object into the component, then yeah. you can just pass in like a predefined Exactly, one. yeah. Nice. yeah. And, and sometimes we can reach in and trick the bits ourselves uh, if we need to. Cool. Uh, when you click on a uh, uh, character and the uh, onto edit the left, yeah. what is the, the, the property of the first event that tells you where the uh, cursor is? All right, so there's a, there's a DOM selection API, which uh, I think Pat talks about in his talk somewhat. Um, let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, so, uh, selection. Okay, so this is a selection API. And uh, yeah, window that gets selection and it gives you all these anchor <coughs> nodes and uh, pivot nodes, and um, it's quite uh, it's quite a complex API. I think it's not it's not if you if you were to do it again, it'd be better. You'd do a better API, I think. Um, uh, it's uh, it's obviously crucial to the comp composer. Um, we have a thing which maps the DOM selection to our block object model selection, and uh, that is isolated and it's well tested. And once it does its job, then we're in a much better world where we have block object model selection. Now we can operate on that uh, much more readily because that's a that's a hierarchy of Ember objects rather than a uh, the DOM, which is uh, quite lucky to work with. I think they would use uh, a paragraph to like, match the select all the text to yeah. make it a bit more. Yeah. So, do you like throw away all that? Can you just sort of tell the browser how to use this new API and use, use yours instead? Is that, that uh, so, so, we use the, the browser's API to tell us what the selection is. Okay, we then map that to a block object model selection. Let's say you click backspace, for example. We then run a backspace command on the block object model. That will then have changed. We'll look at the two HTML representation of that. We'll compare it to the DOM. We'll see what's changed. We'll make those changes ourselves. And then we'll reinstate the carrot where it should be based on what the block object model now says the carrot is. Right, so we, we, we have to do all of like this. There's a lot involved there. And um, uh, the nice thing is that um, uh, no one notices it. <laughs> 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 right, so. Uh, if I select, like there's a very simple example, right? And I click return, right? So it's done all of that right there. Um, but you don't notice it because it's quick enough and it behaves like a normal uh, editor does. So it just seems normal. So I want to use a text editor, but I hate all the testing ones out there and I'll send it very cool. Yeah. Yeah, and it actually is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd say this is uh, one of the uh, funnest things I've ever built. Uh, really challenging, really deceptively challenging. Um, uh, I'm lucky enough to have like really, uh, work with really amazing people, and um, uh, this was a long project. And we at Intercom, we like really short projects, and we like to iterate very quickly. I mean, for obvious reasons, but uh, sometimes you need to take on a six-month project, and this was a six-month project, and um, uh, yeah, it was successful in the end. All right. I have another question. You started out by talking about a pain point, you know, related to content editable and all the different browsers and how they behave. How much time are you spending now? Are you, are you distracted from that? I imagine that you're targeting virtually all the platforms. Uh, no, no. So uh, we, um, I think we've dropped even IE10. Uh, we, we may be thinking of dropping IE10. I mean, obviously, a product like Intercom, and um, we have two parts to it. One is the uh, our customers, customers facing. So the the, the widget, the in-app messenger, the, the JavaScript that's deployed in their application, like Google Analytics or something like that. Um, that's actually a little ba a backbone application, but uh, it has to support IE6, for example. So they live in a completely different world than we do. When we're working on the application, um, uh, obviously our customers were SaaS business. Our customers are uh, in modern companies that have modern SaaS products themselves or mobile apps or whatever. So uh, they tend to use modern equipment, modern browsers, and like it's very easy for us to look at the 
metrics of our browser usage. And it's like, uh, OK, can we drop IE10? And it's like, oh, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's not even 0.02%. Of course we can't. Yeah, it's, it's great like, just to be able to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, we're lucky enough that we work in uh, modern browsers. Right.